Okay, so tonight we are talking about Allensworth and the recent levee breach. It's been on our minds a lot the last few weeks. So folks wanted to know a bit more about the um, context and what else is going on and any updates we can find. So I wanted to give you a much fuller picture of the whole situation because it really is quite the environmental racism, environmental justice debacle. So let's dive in. So to start off, we are visiting the Tulare Lake Bed region for this, um, this webinar. Allensworth is a low-lying unincorporated community and it lies in the Tulare Lake watershed in the Central Valley of California between Bakersfield and Visalia or Fresno area. Tulare Lake once extended 60 miles from tip to tip and it was home to the Tule River tribes of Yoka people and they spoke over 50 dialects of Yoka in this area alone. Allensworth and the neighboring community of Alpa sit at the shoreline of Tulare Lake, which was once the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. The lake was drained in the late 1800s to be used as farmland and at last reappeared during heavy precipitation in 1997. White River, Deer Creek, Poso Creek, Tule River, Kauai River and Kings River drain into the Tulare Lake bed, but they've been mostly tamed by dams, including the Pine Flat Dam on the Kings River, Terminus Dam, which holds back the Kauai River and the Schaefer Dam on the Tule River. Before it, big agriculture subdued the mountain rivers, much of the Southern San Joaquin Valley was transformed each spring into marsh teeming with Tule, elk and antelope, gray and Canada geese, honkers. There was no land that sat lower than this basin. The shallow lake that sprang from their waters, which was dubbed the La Laguna de los Tuleres by Spanish explorers, covered more than 1,200 square miles, which is bigger than the Great Salt Lake. On rafts and canoes made from the thick tule reeds, which you can see here. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, Yoka hunters fished for salmon, perch, and sturgeon, while others waded far into the waters to dig for clams and mussels. The region was so bountiful that European settlers named the area Mussel Slough, and commercial fishermen in the 1870s took to the lake in schooners and steamers to catch terrapin turtles, which were served as delicacies in San Francisco restaurants. Visitors described the big bodies of birds in the sky and their roar when they flew, an immense body of wild geese whose wings and cries would move from place to place, made this kind of roaring noise, wrote Charles Nordoff, a New York journalist who penned one of the first travel books about California in 1873, a noise like the rush of a distant railroad train. That's how he described it, you know, back in the day before, before all the birds were gone. Um, in 1880, in the name of reclamation, the state legislature let newcomers buy marshland for $2.50 an acre, $2 of which would be refunded if they helped construct a levee system. This began a stampede of sand lappers, which was the condescending name they gave farmers who cultivated the swampland. Tulare Lake may have continued to turn up blue on most maps, but in reality by that time, it no longer existed. Then came the farmers with the bigger vision and guile like Colonel James G. Boswell, who was a military and cotton man driven out of Georgia by the boll weevil, and Clarence Sawyer, an alcoholic Virginia hillbilly is how they described him. The two men fought for nearly half a century, blowing up each other's levees in wet years to divert water and in dry years to steal it. They divided the town of Corcoran in half with truck dealers and tractor salesmen aligned with Boswell, and their competitors aligned with Sawyer and the Santa Fe Railroad tracks carving out a thin line between the two that essentially served as a truce marker. So Colonel Allensworth. Alan Allensworth, the youngest of 13 children, was born into slavery in 1842 in Louisville, Kentucky. He was sold and separated from his family at the age of 12, but not before his mother Phyllis instilled in him a vision of what he could become not an enslaved person, but an educated, cultured, influential man. He taught himself to read. He later became a chaplain in the US Army in 1884, which was really an unprecedented position for an African-American at the time. 
He became the highest ranking black officer in army history at the time and achieved the rank of Colonel. He retired in 1906 and two years later moved to attractive land in California he acquired with some supporters. Many black townships were being set up across the country, but only Allensworth was not a government sponsored enterprise. Allensworth dreamed of building a Tuskegee of the West and founded his community in 1908. At its height, 250 people lived and worked in the town comprising nearly 60, oh, sorry, comprising nearly 60 structures, which included a school, a church, and a general store. The community also had a glee club, a brass band, and a ladies' improvement society. The group publicized itself as a new agrarian community for people of color, but according to historian Ed Pope, Allensworth planned something far more ambitious. Buffalo soldiers, Buffalo soldiers who settled there taught able-bodied men how to defend the area, and city leaders inspired by the colonel's friend, Booker T. Washington, made plans for a university that could turn Allensworth into an economic hub for the Central Valley. Allensworth envisioned a town with railroad access, grain warehouses, and a broad economic base. The town spent 2,700 acres, complete with the first free circulation library in Tulare County and a two-room schoolhouse built in 1912. This is the library right here, this image. Um, some families were provided provisional housing for free while they ordered new homes from the Sears catalog. The kits of lumber and supplies would arrive via train. Thankfully, it was at their front door, so everybody, everybody in town would make their way to the station to unload and build the, hem, the homes together as one, said re resident Sasha Briscoe, noting that the local baker always made sure bread was rising when riders arrived, tempting them to patronize nearby businesses. Sadly, the company from which Allensworth acquired the land reneged on the water rights and allowed a stream to be dammed, cutting off the community's water supply, leaving the growing population with debt and dry wells. Historians say it was a racially motivated effort to stunt the town's growth. A competing grain warehouse and railroad spur were built in nearby Alpaw and trains bypassed Allensworth altogether. Drought struck the Central Valley soon after the town was founded, which led to poor crop yields and further decreased vital water supplies. In 1914, the Santa Fe Railroad moved its rail stop from Allensworth to the white town of Alpaw, about 10 miles away, which was a devastating development since trains began to bypass the town. In that same year, on a 1914 trip to Los Angeles to plead for state support for his college, Allensworth died when he stepped off a curb in Monrovia and he was struck by a motorcycle. Police ruled it an accident. Newspapers speculated suicide. Pope, the historian who has reviewed autopsy records, insists it was murder, as do a lot of other people. Without its inspirational leader, the prospect of a Black utopia began to fade and the town's residents began to move away. Allensworth had a backup plan to its stolen tributary diversion, groundwater. The town planned to tap into the ancient aquifers that run deep underground in the Central Valley. A local company that sold them land promised to help dig the wells and build the town's water system, according to several historians. But the firm, Pacific Farming Company, violated its contract and drilled fewer than half of the wells. The town sued Pacific Farming, but reached a settlement, and that ultimately left the town in debt. Meanwhile, the company honored its contract with Alpaw, a majority white community a few miles away, and dug all the wells they had agreed to. These battles over water access were prevalent throughout California in the early 20th century. As the Central Valley became an agricultural powerhouse, black migrants flocked to it for a piece of the California dream, along with immigrants from Mexico, Japan, India, and the Philippines. But more established local farmers, almost all of whom were white, sought to control as much of the state's water as possible. The results, say Jonathan London, an associate professor at the UC Davis Department of Human Ecology, was a separate but unequal system of water provisions. When corporate interests resorted to illegal behavior, communities of color took them to court, but they rarely got a fair hearing. It was a really difficult situation. 
getting squeezed by the corporations on one hand in a way that was really racially biased, and then having a judicial system that was also racially biased, said London. They really had nowhere to turn. Without a secure water supply, Allensworth's farmers couldn't get enough water for their crops, and they faced other racist roadblocks. Local companies charged Black farmers nearly four times as much for land as white farmers, then tried to prevent them from buying land altogether. Residents ultimately regained control, but the water table declined over the years due to drought and diverted waterways, allowing arsenic, a tasteless, odorless, and naturally occurring toxic chemical, to become more prevalent underground. The problem persists today. In the 1960s, a developer wanted to buy the site of the town, tear down the remaining structures, and build a resort. Descendants of the original Allensworth fought the residents fought the plan. Um, by 1970, Allensworth could no longer even be found on a map. But after nearly eight years of lobbying, they got the land designated a state historic park in 1976. Whew. This led former resident Cornelius Ed Pope, the same historian, to launch an initiative to revitalize and memorialize his hometown. In 1974, California State Parks restored several buildings and declared Allensworth a historic landmark. Visitors slowly trickled in and recreational vehicles packed the historic camp parks campground in the 1990s, but the crowds didn't last. Over nearly 40 years, Nettie Morrison, honorary mayor, coordinated hundreds of events, founded several organizations and programs, and she successfully fought off planned environmental threats such as sludge treatment facility, a turkey ranch, and a mega dairy farm. Today, the population is around 600 residents and the town is now just 5% African American. Residents work on nearby farms, planting and harvesting almonds, pistachios, grapes, and pomegranates. The town hosts about 70,000 plus visitors each year. The park is open year round and is a rare historically black community that you can visit in person on self-guided tours since limited funding has forced the closure of buildings outside of special events like Founders Day, Black History Month, and Juneteenth. But with little to do in the town on the other side of the park gates, visitors often head out of the area after only a few hours of walking. In town, dogs run free in a community without sidewalks, past a collection of trailers and homes in disrepairs, and yards have rusted vehicles and aging farm equipment. Nine historic buildings are scattered today across 240 acres at the site of the former town center. Remember earlier I said there were 60. They remain furnished to reflect the time period in Allensworth's pioneering efforts in Black self-determination. Today, the rail station's ticket booth sits at the entrance of the historic park to provide visitors a visual representation of life in the early 1900s. But Allensworth history buffs like Sasha Briscoe and Dennis Hudson a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, tend to view it as a grim reminder of the forces that killed the growing agrarian community. Not a lot of people know about this town, which is a shame because it's history right here in your backyard. It's like not knowing who Cesar Chavez is if you're from the Valley or Dr. King while living in Atlanta, said Peter Beck, who teaches modern world history and ethnic studies at Fresno Unified. You have to know where you came from to know where you're going, he added. Only then can you appreciate the work that people did before you and then move that work forward generation to generation. The history books won't let us out of slavery, said resident Alice Royal. The story of Black Americans seems to focus solely on that aspect of our history. But we were soldiers, doctors, musicians, nurses, politicians, judges, writers, too. That's the story of Allensworth, and that's what this town is all about. So I wanted to give you that context of Allensworth and their rich history before we then talk about the breach so you can kind of see the much bigger picture. So the mid-March storms have sent floodwater coursing through canals and ditches and flowing across farmland toward the old lake bottom. Remember, it used to be a lake. When residents saw water surging towards the community on Thursday, March 16th, so only a few weeks ago, they said that more than 25 residents used sandbags, rocks, and plywood to plug the flow through two culverts on uh, Highway 43 beside the BNSF train tracks. The water flowing from the White River is coming through property owned by the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. 
or BNSF. BNSF Railway sent contractors who then came with machinery and removed the sandbags and plywood. This is the same Santa Fe Railroad that ran through Allensworth that refused to put a station in town in 1914, if you remember that. March 18th. Sorry, March 18 started really early for the head of Deer Creek Flood Control District's Jack Mitchell, who's 83 years old. He headed out to check the creek's flow at 2.30 a.m. When he left it on Friday, the creek was flowing well and keeping it in its banks, at least through his district. But Mitchell found a sheet of water where it shouldn't be. Overnight on March 18th, a breach happened along Deer Creek drainage at Avenue 56, west of Road 88 in Tulare County. The breach sent water into nearby farmland. Cal Fire, Tulare County responded to help repair the breach on private land. A dozer operator hired by the landowner became stuck in the mud while working and had to be hoisted out by helicopter. Tulare County Sheriff Mike Boudreaux said there were five breaches, breach locations in the levee. They began trying to repair these breaches immediately. However, it was unsuccessful with the amount of water. The water completely encompassed and encircled those communities of Alpaw and Allensworth, Boudreaux said. Runoff from streams like White River, Deer Creek, and Poso Creek flowed uninterrupted. A helicopter flew over the broken levee and was dropping loads of sand to plug it throughout the weekend while a crew was using nearby machinery to help close the leak. Um, I'm just going to ask folks to mute themselves. Thank you. Farmer Chad Gorsman discovered that someone had purposely cut the banks at the Road 88 crossing. He found muddy tracks from heavy equipment leading away from the hole and toward an equipment in early March, a nearby town. Mitchell said he believes a levee breach was caused by someone intentionally cutting through the earthen barrier with machinery. They did it with a backhoe with a big skip loader. We tracked it down, Mitchell said. We know who's done it. Residents of both Allensworth and nearby Alpa, which together combined has about 1,400 residents, they were ordered to evacuate that Thursday throughout the weekend because roads may become impassable and rescues would be more difficult. Others chose to stay behind and build berms to protect their land and their animals. Many people there raised cattle, pigs, goats, and chickens. And, you know, obviously a drowning would be super sad, so I'm glad some of them stuck it out. As of March 21st, it was suggested by experts that to save Allensworth and the nearby town of Alpaw, Jack Mitchell needs to make a cut in the banks of the Homeland Canal owned by the J.G. Boswell Company to allow high flood, flood flows from the Pozo Creek to drain into the canal. But the Boswell Company had placed a land plane, which is a heavy piece of equipment at the intersection of the Homeland Canal and Pozo Creek, and threatened Mitchell with arrest if he moves the land plane. The Tulare County Board of Supervisors has failed to take action on the situation. Lena Kent, a spokesperson for BNSF, said that the residents had come onto railroad property and that their actions had put the railway infrastructure at risk. That wasn't the right approach, Kent said. She said railway officials were concerned that plugging the culverts. So I'm just going to ask folks to mute and um, I think I will. Just go through and see who, great, thank you. Um, she said railway officials were concerned that plugging the culverts would send water scouring the railway property and we could have had a track give way there. I just think that they put a lot of people in danger by doing what they did that evening, Kent said. I completely sympathize and understand what they're trying to do, but perhaps they should focus on protecting and sandbacking around their property. She said BNSF is open to hearing ideas from the community and is also working with the county and the state to protect the railway infrastructure. BNSF isn't responsible for decisions about floodwater on its property, said Kent. Those decisions are made by other agencies such as California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection or CAL FIRE and the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, she added. It slowed water flow to their tracks for heaven's sake. How could that be dangerous? Community member Coyote Kadara said, when you do something like that, destroy the effort of a community, come up with a solution. There's no solution in sight right now. Kadara said, if nothing else, BNSF could have helped them create a better way to block or divert the water flow. If they were going to remove it, come up with a plan. 
they're claiming that what we did was detrimental to their rail tracks. And I'm saying if we reduce flow along the rail tracks, it's beneficial to the railroad. BNSF has offered to make a donation to a nonprofit that supports Ellensworth, said Kadara. The money would help some residents down the road, but it still isn't a solution to the problem at hand, he added. This was just, hey, maybe if we give them some money, it'll shut them up, but they forgot who we're dealing with out here, said Kadara. We will keep fighting. We'll keep asking questions. We don't have a choice at this point. So let's talk about responses from a few different agencies. Over the weekend of March 18th and 19th, Red Cross dropped off supplies to residents in Allensworth. In all of Tulare County as of March, there have been more than 112 water rescues and over 1,500 flood-related calls, said County Fire Chief Charlie Norman. Norman said the incident action plan is divided into six branches with about 65 people assigned to help with each branch. There, there are approximately 700 personnel from agencies throughout the state assigned to the flooding situation, he said. Local leaders say they need help from county, state, and local officials to protect their town in that week and in the floods expected throughout the rest of the spring. Flood District's Mitchell hoped for help from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Residents want the railway and Tulare County to work with them to help at least control all the flooding when storms like this hit. Red residents there say they are feeling like no one is coming to help them. Communities are suffering, homes are still getting flooded, the property is getting flooded right now, and this is six days of nonstop flooding, said a resident six days after the breach. They wouldn't allow this water to come into a white town, Kadera said, standing beside the flood swollen ditch where water flowed through the culvert under the road. During the floods, he got a call and announced to the crowd that the farmer across Highway 43 from Allensworth said if they had the machinery, the townspeople were welcome to divert the White River onto his land. Several men immediately took off on ATVs to assess the situation and start work on the diversion. Kadara was grateful, the kind gest grateful for the kind gesture and hopeful that they could make it work. The flooding has brought the community together because as a community, we have to get together to fight our own battles, said Coyote Kadara. Kadera and his wife, Denise Kadera, who sits on the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board, started working their phones trying for state senators, assistance to Governor Newsom, anyone they could find at a high level to get that land plane moved off of the canal. It's just, I can't understand it. It's just so ugly to do this to people, to a whole community, Denise Kadara said. On March 24th, Kadara, um, Coyote Kadara, said he invited BNSF to bring hydrologists and assess the situation with the community. This was a week after, but he had heard nothing back. They've just ignored us, he said. They haven't come up with a solution to help this community in seven days, and there's still water flowing here. Staff from Congressman Dev David Valadeo's office reached out to BNSF to inquire about the situation. That was only to establish a point of contact, said a spokesperson for his office. Carla Nemeth, director of the State Department of Water Resources, finally toured Allensworth on March 24th to meet with community leaders to discuss issues and potential solutions. Nemeth told residents that she'd meet with her engineers and see if there was something that could be done about the White River flow. Before Nemeth's visit, no agencies took responsibility for decisions about the flooding in Allensworth. The small town is still under jurisdiction of Deer Creek Stormwater District. In terms of the investigation into who actually broke the levy, Sheriff Boudreaux said he has no plans to investigate or pursue charges against whoever it was that broke the levy. Meanwhile, in Corcoran, a nearby town in, in the Central Valley, the levy protecting nearby Corcoran had its own protection as an armed guard patrolled the structure to keep it safe, according to Joe Faulkner, the city public works director who told the supervisors, the board of supervisors at a March 15th special meeting on the floods that the guard was there to keep it from being touched. Dustin Fuller, head of the Cross Creek Flood, Flood Control District, which owns the levee, said the guard is mostly just another pair of eyes to make sure everything is operating as it should. At the south end of the old lake bed, the Tulare Lake bed, the J.G. Boswell Company had workers drag a piece of heavy equipment onto the banks of its homeland canal to prevent any cuts that would drain Poso Creek water onto Boswell land. A tense political, political battle ended with the Kings County Board of Supervisors voting to cut a levy 
on Bozo's land to relieve building pressure from the Tule River where the South Fork of the Kings River meet. Boswell representatives had argued it was better to fill the fringes of the lakes first where Boswell has built massive flood cells over the years, but other farmers and residents disagreed, arguing to fill the lake from the bottom up, said Supervisor Doug Verboon. Let the water run downhill was a common refrain from numerous residents. Ultimately, supervisors agreed, issuing a proclamation that levy 749 on Boswell's land would be cut at its highest point, though it wasn't stated when that would happen. So many Central Valley farmers get water deliveries from the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project, which as many of you know, is water delivered from the Bay Delta. But like most small valley towns, Allensworth doesn't have access to this water source. Instead, it's still tapping its shrinking aquifer, which according to residents tastes unusually good. There's an itty bitty sweetness to it, say residents. Most people in town only use the water to shower, wash dishes, or flush toilets. Pretty sure they probably shouldn't be showering that, but, or dishes, but um, most haven't had a drink from it in years. Come to find out the water was contaminated with arsenic, said a resident. In Allensworth, some wells have arsenic levels 15 times the legal limit. State officials have known about Allensworth arsenic problems since at least the 1960s, but for decades, residents say they weren't told how dangerous it was. Many didn't find out about it until the 1990s. By then, residents had been drinking the contaminated water their entire lives. According to a state auditor's report in 2021, nearly a million Californians face an increased risk of cancer, kidney problems, and other long-term health crises because their water isn't safe to drink. Many systems are contaminated I don't know how you did that, but that's pretty neat. Um, many systems are contaminated by nitrate pollution arising from farming or by arsenic, which can become more concentrated when farmers overpump their aquifers. We've talked about this before. So essentially, um, when chemicals like arsenic and uh, pesticides, they tend to be heavier than water, so they sink to the bottom of aquifers. So as drillers you know, drill more and more water, um, what's left isn't able to mix as well and dilute it, as well as it sinks to the bottom. So you're getting closer and closer to that heavy, um, dense, yucky uh, toxins down there. And um, it's coming up higher and higher. And then you don't have as much water to flush it out in a drought state. So the water is only getting worse. Um, according to other studies, the communities suffering from contamination are disproportionately black and brown without the resources to fix the problem, the report noted. The California State Water Resources Control Board has the funding to help these failing water systems, but the agency has generally demonstrated a lack of urgency in providing this critical assistance, the state auditor's report said. In February 2021, panicked residents began calling Allensworth Community Service District to say that the water was no longer coming out of their taps. Community leaders spent the rest of the weekend scrambling to find the source of the problem. It turned out that the few pumps on a, or pumps on a few of Allensworth's water wells had failed. The system is old and prone to breaking, and it took the town a month to fully fix it. Then the water system broke down again a few months later. Clean, safe, and affordable drinking water is considered a human right under state law. To some extent, the state's historic climate change fuel drought is to blame. The number of dry wells in California has shot up by more than 70% in 2021. Many of them in the valley. We also know a lot of that is due to overpumping and other issues. Right now, the only arsenic-free water in Allensworth comes from a small spigot in the center of town across the street from the elementary school. There are two black solar panels a few feet away, which emit a mechanical buzz beneath the squabbling of nearby chickens. The hydro panel system pulls moisture out of the air. Other people buy bottled water. Besides the hydro panel spigot, because arsenic level, uh, arsenic levels in water in, are so high in Allensworth, they'll get their water from wells that are about three miles away. The water has an acceptable amount of arsenic to consume, which is 10 parts per billion, according to the US EPA. However, now all this water is potentially mixing from the flooding. Kadera said he doesn't know how safe their drinking water will be. 
When you come into the community here, we've seen levels as high as 300 parts per billion. So we don't know what this is all doing for us right now. Is it mixing? Is it making it better? Or is it making it worse? So what are the implications of this breach? Flooding from snowmelt will continue to be an issue throughout the spring and into the summer, Allensworth officials have said. According to water expert and Sierra Club member Deirdre Desjardins, this chaotic situation is a result of the complete failure of the Tulare County Hazard Mitigation Plan to do any kind of planning for routing flood flows to protected levees. Some excerpts she, she pulled say, um, in page 91, currently there is no database for the county that completely accounts for all levees and their condition. Without the location and design or condition of each levee, the extent of levee failures for the county cannot be determined. Probability of future events? Well, due to the lack of knowledge regarding the levee systems in the county, the probability of future levee failures in the county is unknown. However, levee failure may result from a large winter storm or seismic event. Therefore, due to past levee failure history, it is considered possible, but unlikely that a levee failure event will occur within the next year, 10 years, which is a one in 10 year chance of occurring, which is still 10%. Event history is less than or equal to 10% likelihood per year. So the feature of Allensworth, I've got a link for you to donate to the immediate relief of flooding for residents of Allensworth. If you're interested, it's a mutual aid group. Beyond the breach, Friends of Allensworth and Allensworth Progressive Association are local organizations now working with residents to continue the Colonel's quest for empowerment by developing agricultural academies and an organic sustainable farm that could one day serve as an economic engine for the region. Their efforts were boosted by the state's $40 million allocation to the region in 2022. So the nonprofits now hope to move Colonel Allensworth vision forward. They will oversee the creation of a farming training program for people of color and socially marginalized groups with hopes of harnessing the environmental benefits of rabbitry and vermiculture composting. It's why we have to preserve this place and the history so that kids understand the life you see now is not the life it has always been, Sasha Briscoe said, staring out at a field of lush grass packed with buzzing pollinators, intact outhouses, and landmark structures. Advocating for clean water is central to the town's prosperity as environmental conditions, technical and financial challenges, and racist land use practices have prevented Allensworth from having safe and reliable drinking water. Residents deal with limited sources of potable water thanks to contamination from arsenic. Community activism brought in an arsenic removal pilot project in 2019 and secured $3.8 million from AB74 and the State Water Board's Safer Program in late 2021 to help build a larger water supply well and arsenic treatment system. The project was scheduled to be completed last month in March 2023. Residents say that Colonel Allensworth's vision of a self-sustaining Black community is very much alive today. Allensworth remains a symbol of freedom and determination with their motto, the town that refuses to die. So, oh, you know, I'll, I'll share my sources if anyone um, wants to keep reading and, nope, I'm not sharing the screen. Well, I'll send you the notes and the, the links if anyone is interested. Um, so questions, comments, if people just have feelings that they wanna share about this whole situation. From Happy Earth Month. I know who that Happy. is. Katie, uh, Billy put his hand up a couple of times. Oh, you put your hand up, Billy? Go ahead. Yeah. Good affirmative. And um so um so is it so did they have any water on Ellenworth? Did you have any what on Ellenworth? Ellenworth? Oh yeah, water. Yeah, yeah. Or do you mean because of the flooding or did they have water before the flooding? Yes. So before the flooding, 
um, they had, well, originally 100 plus years, 1914, nope, 1908, they had the access to the tributaries from those four or five rivers I mentioned, but then those those rivers got diverted, so that went out. They had some groundwater, but the the folks who were contracted to pump for them, they didn't follow through. So then a lot of that went to Alpa, that was taken. And then other large farmers like J.G. Boswell diverted even more. So then they really weren't left with much. And then the water they did have um, is pretty heavy with arsenic. So they didn't really have much for mm -hmm. potable water anyway before the big floods happened. And now that the floods happened, yeah, they are they are flooded so yeah that's right. and how's that now do they do do they have any water now yeah they're still flooded and um they think it's gonna continue as the snow melt um continues to melt throughout the spring so this could go on for a while um i haven't seen anything on what dwr is actually planning to do they said that they would look into it and try to help. Um, I haven't seen any reporting on what the follow-up has been. And I've talked to people in the area that I know and they said um, they haven't seen anything and that the big concern there is, is anyone gonna get in trouble for what happened? And uh, people are pretty frustrated that no, nothing's, no one's getting into trouble and no investigation is being done. But if anyone else has heard in a more recent update, um, feel free to share. A lot of their water is probably also gone due to subsidence. We've talked about that, how in the Central Valley, a lot of the land under them is clay and like a silty clay. So as the water gets sucked out, it condenses and it's um, a lot harder to fill that back in with water unless you use direct injection, which is expensive and energy consuming. So it's also hard to put water back into some of the, some of the aquifers. Any other questions, thoughts, feelings? It's a heavy topic. I can also turn off the recording if people want to say things off of the recording. So Katie, I have a question. So even though that they, uh, they arrived there um, and there was groundwater in the aquifer at the time, they never received any water rights because of um, they were the receive the racism happening at the time. Um, did they did they ever win the did they ever sue the company that was supposed to originally drill wells for them? Yeah, so they didn't they didn't, to my knowledge, they didn't sue the folks with the water rights who were because it was like multiple water issues. They didn't sue the folks with the water rights, they did so sue the folks who were supposed to be drilling. That was Pacific Farming Company. And they got a settlement for that, but that settlement wasn't even enough money to pay their legal fees. So they ended up in debt. I've also seen some people say that their, some more modern people say their dream is to eventually start farming some of the original crops that were grown there. Um, a lot of the people who migrated there at the time grew cotton and kale and black eyed peas. So they'd like to start farming those things too um, as the economy improves over there. I mean, it's promising that they, they got this $40 million grant and they also got the $3.8 million grant to kind of work on you know economic stimulation in sustainable ways. So hopefully that will help with um, some of the situation, although the flood is probably much more expensive than any of those grants can really afford. Absolutely. I mean, to just to put in infrastructure, it's going to cost more than 40 million. The yeah. place still doesn't have infrastructure. 
So that's going to be, you know, um, a really big issue. That plus just flood cleanup and, um, you know, without any investigation, I'm thinking without a police report, you can't sue people sometimes. So without an investigation into who did it, that option is kind of out the door. All right, any other questions, comments? Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording.